Nuestra segunda cumbre internacional de arquitectura, la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Puerto Rico en Ponce. Le da la bienvenida a todos. Le agradecemos que hayan tomado su tiempo para estar aquí disfrutando de la actividad que da comienzo a la cumbre titulada Arquitectura, Políticas y Normativas, una conferencia magistral que vamos a estar presentando. Antes de comenzar, quisiéramos eh, mencionarles, ya que todos están sentados, que por favor los que tienen... Eh, un teléfono celular que por favor tome la gentileza de ponerlo en modalidad de silencio. Y antes de comenzar queremos agradecer muy especialmente a los profesores que han estado trabajando en esta iniciativa. Esta cumbre es la culminación de una iniciativa que comenzó y que hemos estado trabajando durante este semestre en la Escuela de Arquitectura. Projects of New City Ecology es el nombre de esa iniciativa, un acrónimo para Ponce, donde hemos tenido una serie de invitados y que entonces hoy se unen otros invitados para... A queremos agradecer a los profesores y estudiantes que están acá de la Pontificia Universidad Católica, la Escuela de Arquitectura. Queremos agradecer a los profesores y estudiantes que se encuentran de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Universidad Politécnica de Puerto Rico. También profesores y estudiantes de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Universidad de Puerto Rico miembros eh, de la Junta y demás miembros del Instituto Americano de Arquitectos, capítulo de Puerto Rico, miembros eh, de Junta y colegiados del Colegio de Arquitectos y Arquitectos Paisajistas de Puerto Rico y un agradecimiento muy especial a las personas y las instituciones que han sido nuestros patrocinadores de este evento, tanto Air Master Windows and Doors como Integrated Design Solutions Inc., IDS, se encuentra con nosotros también aquí. Estamos muy, muy agradecidos, un agradecimiento especial para ellos. Y queremos también agradecer a los invitados internacionales que tenemos acá, que quisiera que, según los mencioné, eh, pues pudieran eh, levantar su mano. Tenemos aquí a Alana Heiss, directora de... <risa> directora de ArtOnAir.org y de Clock Tower Gallery. Arquitecto Axel Friedman, principal de arquitectos y asociados. Arquitecto Hernández Alonso, principal y fundador de Cefiro, director del programa graduado de SciArc, quien ha estado como profesor visitante durante el semestre con la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Católica. Y Sin Ming Fung. Directora de Asuntos Académicos en SciArc, Marcelo Espina, principal y fundador de Patterns, coordinador del programa de sistemas emergentes, programa graduado de SciArc, Peter Selner, coordinador de SciArc y Facultad de Diseño, Theodor Spiropoulos, Director del Laboratorio de Investigación de Architectural Association y Director de Minima Forms, arquitecto Tom, Tom Wiscombe, <plausos> principal y fundador de Emergent y miembro de la Facultad de SAIR también. Ahora queremos dejar con ustedes a Javier de Jesús Martínez, nuestro decano asociado de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Pontificia Universidad Católica, para que podamos abrir esta cumbre internacional. Muy buenas noches, bienvenidos todos y todas. Me uno al saludo protocolar. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Eh, no saben lo lindo que se ve este auditorio desde aquí arriba. Eh, les agradezco profundamente su presencia. La apertura de esta cumbre, eh, como muy bien menciona Pedro, es la segunda cumbre internacional que celebra nuestra escuela. Septiembre del año 2009, la Pontificia Universidad Católica dio un paso decisivo en poder eh, transformar la práctica de la arquitectura y con esto eh, viene acompañado también la transformación de nuestras ciudades. Ciertamente poder iniciar esta cumbre implica una reflexión sobre la educación de la arquitectura y quisiera poder 
eh, tomar unos segundos de ustedes para poder reflexionar sobre esto. En el ámbito internacional, la, la valoración del conocimiento e innovación en servicios, procesos y productos la aceleración en la que aumenta el caudal de conocimiento sobre la sociedad, los cambios en el mercado laboral y las profesiones, así como la incremental apertura de los bordes del mundo mercantil, comercial, hacia nuevas cadenas de valor, presentan un reto sin precedentes para las instituciones de educación universitaria. Este reto presenta oportunidades para instituciones universitarias enlazadas a redes a nivel global que cuentan con, con programas altamente innovadores, que, que representen magnetos para investigadores, académicos, profesionales y sobre todo estudiantes. Es frente a estos retos y oportunidades que se gesta la histórica fundación y apertura de la Escuela de Arquitectura de la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Puerto Rico. La Declaración Mundial sobre la Educación Superior del Siglo XXI de la UNESCO establece en su preámbulo que en los albores del nuevo siglo se, se observa una demanda de educación superior sin precedentes, acompañada de una gran diversificación de la misma y una mayor toma de conciencia de la importancia fundamental de este tipo de educación reviste para el desarrollo sociocultural y económico para la construcción del futuro, de cara al cual las nuevas generaciones deberán estar preparadas con nuevas competencias y nuevos conocimientos y sobre todo, ideales. Ante este escenario de futuro, la creación de nuevas ofertas y la redimensión programática e institucional debe ser esta sólidamente fundamentadas en un alcance global y preceptos académicos y administrativos que viabilicen dicho alcance. Durante el pasado semestre, la Escuela de Arquitectura ha estado colaborando con el Instituto eh, CIARC en Los Ángeles, con quienes hemos estado estrechando una alianza especial. Una alianza especial que nos ha permitido colaborar con importantes arquitectos de renombre internacional, arquitectos que han permitido eh, y se han eslabonado a profesores de nuestra escuela para así conducir una investigación única. Esa investigación, y quiero aprovechar la oportunidad para decirle que va a estar siendo presentada públicamente mañana en la escuela, en nuestra escuela allí en Ponce, y va a estar abierta al público para que cada uno de ustedes, cuando gusten, puedan pasar y formar parte de él. Culmina esta, este semestre de investigación con esta cumbre, y sobre todo con la invitación del director de SIAR como conferenciante principal y magistral de este, en esta cumbre. El arquitecto Erico Huemos, y le decía yo a Erico ahorita, hay muchas generaciones esperándote, para que hables en Puerto Rico y evidencia esto es la audiencia, ha sido un arquitecto muy destacado que ha estado trabajando a nivel global y que viene hoy directamente, llegó en la noche, en la tarde de ayer, directamente de Inglaterra, de recibir el premio Charles Jenks, un premio que se otorga a la innovación, pero no solamente la innovación en el área académica o en el área teórica, sino también en el componente práctico de la arquitectura. Es precisamente allí donde nuestra escuela interesa poder llevar a nuestro estudiantado y poder elevar la discusión pública sobre lo que es la arquitectura. Quiero poder dar la bienvenida al arquitecto Erico Huemos y que venga aquí a ilustrarnos con su conferencia magistral. Si las lágrimas fueran que sea. Good evening. Thank you very much, Javier. Pleasure to be here. Thank you all, particularly University of Ponce, for the invitation uh, to myself and to my colleagues uh, from SIARC. Great to be here. War, famine, pestilence, death, and architecture. You recognize that equation or no? So this probably asks a lot of war, famine, pestilence, and death to be able to live up to the latter. And I, I have to confess that, that in my aspirations, and probably there are a few of you who, who share this, that the revelatory or evangelical aspect 
the prowess of architecture or the capacity of architecture to act at that level as a prognosis of what might be coming is at least an aspiration for architecture, albeit it, it, it rarely appears in that form. But I think the reason I started with this image has more to do with a contemporary condition in architecture, and I'll tell you what I mean. This is a wood etching by a German artist, Durer, that was done in the 15th century. And if this were a 15th century audience and we showed this image to you, my guess is that you would all know, without a lot of help, what it said, what it meant, what it suggested. It has a story or a narrative that belongs to it. So notwithstanding the, the, the talents of Durer, the skill of Durer, the capacity of Durer, the power of the image, the power of the image very much relates to the story it includes as part of it. And I think my point generally is that as generally held stories diminish now so that we don't all relate to a particular myth or fable or story, the power of images, and indeed the power of this image lessons. I wouldn't necessarily argue that we have to resurrect, and this is a, probably an impossibility, to resurrect the general story that we could all relate to, but at least in an existential way, in a personal way, if the object, if the architecture has that aspect, meaning it has a meaning aside from its ability to demonstrate technical skill and acumen and capacity. So again, the meaning of architecture belongs to both its content, its human content, its story, its narrative, generic or existential, not just its technical acumen, which I think is more and more what the history, contemporary history of architecture is about next. Thank you very much. This is a drawing by John Cocteau, 1913, of Stravinsky's presentation of the Firebird or the Rite of Spring. And somebody, uh, some of you may know the story. It's a famous story about the ride. This, this was presented with very famous characters, Digolov and Nijinsky, in the theater in the Champs-Élysées in Paris in May of 1913. And there was a riot, or there wasn't a riot, or it was presented in a certain way, or it wasn't. I think if the story is not true, it probably should be true. But the reason that, that I shared it with you tonight, I think again has to do, just like with the first image, with the question of meaning. This happens to be in music, but it also could apply to architecture. Because dealing in, not to get too technical with music, but atonalities and dissonance and primitive music, what Stravinsky is asking, what he's asking is what is music? What is music? And we can also ask, what is architecture? I think that's our job. And what I would say is that architecture divides now, divides, it, it, let, me, let me put it this way, between those who think that what we know about the world is almost complete. We know almost everything and we just need to fill in the details as opposed to those who think that in perpetuity we will always be behind. There will always be much more to know, much more to know than we can ever know. More to know than we can ever know. And if that's the case, then architecture becomes more an investigation more of a case of wonder or discovery, 
less so if you think we almost got it all figured out, in which case architecture, however skillful, winds up being much more a manifestation of technical skill. So it's wonder versus technique to make it simple. Next one. If you don't recognize the haircut, this is the Medusa. Uh, it comes from, so be careful if you look too long, it, you turn to, to, to stone. And this comes from the cistern across from Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, which was once known as Constantinople. And I think the, the reason for, for presenting this to you in terms of the first portion of this talk a general discussion about what architecture is and what it might be has to do with how architecture moves, how it moves and how it changes. So to keep it simple, this was done by the Romans across from Hagia Sophia, underground, so a series of columns and beams pilfered from an old Greek temple which they destroyed, a temple to Medusa, holds up the roof of the cistern and the water runs down and, 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 and they collect the water. And it's my hypothesis that this is a vicious attack by the Romans on the Greeks, that whatever the prowess of, prowess of the Romans, whatever their prowess, whatever their energy, whatever their capacity, whatever the scale at which they work, whatever their momentum, they still don't have Phidias. They still don't have Aeschylus. So there's a poetic aspect that belongs to, to the Greeks that is antithetical to what belongs to the Romans. Ergo, they took the Greek temple, they tore it apart, they reassembled it, they took the Godhead and turned it upside down and stuck it halfway underwater. This is the way architecture moves, I think, in many cases, not increment by increment in a Darwinian way, but very aggressively. When one position takes sway over another and insists that the world is different and has become different and needs to manifest itself in a different way, very aggressively. So architecture changed not as, changes not as a congeniality quotient, but it's an act of aggression. Next. Uh, this, is, this is a slide from the artist Henry Moore, and it's called The Helmet. And the helmet is not like the typical helmet that you recognize, not a football helmet, which you put on, it covers your ears, it protects your face, and is essentially congruent with your head. So this is the conventional helmet. This is the atypical helmet of Henry Moore, where an object is made which, which sequesters, but not completely, another object which in a formal sense is entirely different. And I like to use this, actually, this is a model for me. It may not be a literal model, but it's an architectural model, it's a metaphorical model of how pieces of a project dissonant pieces, disconnected pieces, might be related to one, one to the other. And the way we label this is, is the following. We call the outside of the project the outside of the outside, which is the most extroverted part of the discussion and the most public part of the discussion. And then it moves as a chronology internally to the most introverted part of the discussion. So it goes from the outside of the outside then to the next surface, which is the inside of the outside, then to the glue, which is an amorphous connection between outside and inside. So outside of the outside, inside of the outside, glue, outside of the inside, inside of the inside. We made a book from this with Gianfranco Monticelli about 10 years ago called Gnostic Architecture, using this as a conceptual model of differentiation, piece to piece, Inside to outside, extrovert to introvert, next. Uh, let me give you about a 30 second history of the last 100 years of architecture, in case you missed some of that. 
starting uh, in the early 1900s. And I think essentially the point, and I, my guess is it applies to all of us, to all of you in one way or another. Architecture has a very predictable habit of borrowing, borrowing, pilfering, pedigreed antecedents, precedents that have nothing ipso facto to do with architecture and associating those precedents with the doing of architecture. So if you want to be a radical architect, kid, do this, follow this, it'll make you a radical architect. I'll show you what I mean. So early in, in the 20th century, this happens to be one Gris, but it could be Gris, it could be Brock, it could be Picasso, the Cubas, and then about 25 years later, Le Corbusier in Algiers. So you could say architecture is Cubism. Next. And then uh, 1925 or so, the Ford assembly line, technique, technology, hey, they build cars that way, let's build houses that way. <laughs> Ever heard that? So technique, technology, hardware, images of those as a pedigree for building, heard that before, and the Bauhaus on your right. Next. Uh, the metabolis and the human body. So this brings us to to who? To, Ken, uh, to Kenzo Tange, to Kurosawa, to Kiko Take, all of these guys with the advent of very sophisticated studies about the human body, metabolism. So metabolism as, as a sophisticated study of physical science, ergo architecture is metabolism. Next. Um, and Paul Demon, not Jacques Derrida, a literary critic who began his career writing in France for a in, in Brussels for a paper paper called Le Soir, but wound up at Yale for many years. A very famous literary critic who really coined the term deconstruction. So, what is deconstruction? And this is a literary theory. To be very simple-minded about it, it means you know, there isn't a single Moby Dick by Herman Melville. There are just Mobys and Dicks, <laughs> as many of you as are here. So this is, in a way, deconstruction, Mobys and Dicks. And, and so here comes Peter Eisenman, the Wexner, who became a deconstructive architect. Ergo, literary criticism, architecture is deconstruction. And finally, next one, next one, uh, digital coding, uh, uh, fairly current at the moment, although dissipating uh, the matrix and digital coding. And then on the right is, is the work of, of a young architect who is at least in part affiliated with that, who teaches at UCLA, his name is Jason Payne. In any event, architecture is digital coding. So architecture is cubism. Architecture is mechanics, technique, and engineering. Architecture is metabolism. Architecture is literary criticism. Architecture is digital coding. So that probably covers almost everybody one way or the other. And I wouldn't accept myself from that except to say that when we work, I think we're cognizant of the pressures to, to, to assign meaning, which really belongs, in a sense, to, to other fields and other endeavors as they, as they proceed in their explorations. Anyway, next one. And a couple more of, of that sort of uh, discussion. This is Alamogordo in the early 1940s and Oppenheimer and his uh, pals uh, inventing what turned out to be the atomic bomb. And there's clearly an association in architecture with, with an affinity with 
an association with an interest in the prowess of technique and technology as if science is a kind of architectural nirvana and gives credence to a certain kind of work. It's advanced science, ergo it has content. Well, this is absolutely silly. These guys, this is applied science. Nobody said, nobody said these guys had to make an atomic bomb. So splitting the atom, we can talk to Democritus. But what they did with it, which is to say whether they made a submarine or a hospital or the Mars rover or whatever it is. In other words, the application of science isn't to building or anything else has to be looked at critically from a human point of view. It's not ipso facto a virtue if it's assigned to some architectural meaning. Next. Um, another one uh, of, of a similar kind of background. On the left, you know Mondrian and, and his work and his aspiration, I think, as he put it, to, to distinguish between the superfluous in the world and the essence of things. And this is a long time discussion in architecture and art and what constitutes an essence. So for him, in this manifestation, it's a straight line, it's black, white, and gray, it's red, white, and blue, it's a right angle, it's all of those. So this is a kind of aesthetic, poetic, intellectual premise, except when you look at the right and you see, this is what the painting actually looked like. So on the left is what he presented, and on the right, uh, a virtue of Soy and Victoria Newhouse, who have the Broadway boogie woogie hanging in their house. That's what the painting looked like. So the essence and the austerity that they argue for is not, in fact, in the painting at all. The qualities of the painting don't represent the qualities of the argument. And I think it's important to understand that. In, and in the end, again, to simplify the discussion of architecture, probably to the point where it's not so helpful, maybe the debate in the end between points of view in architecture is either almost nothing in an austerity sense, or almost everything in terms of how one makes things in space. But what I find curious about Mondrian is apparently he, unbeknownst to him, he seemed to be able to do both simultaneously. Next. Uh, this, this I shot at the uh, Lyon Ballet. Uh, there's there's an American saying, what you see, you've probably heard it, in fact, you probably use it. Uh, what you see, what you see is what you get. And I think the point of this is what you see is n absolutely not what you see, and what you get is never what you see. And this has to do with thinking again about meaning in architecture as it's given in form and space. And what they did here, you know, when you, when you think about a dancer who is he or she, who is athletic, acrobatic, flipping around, muscular, dexterous, you know, all of, all of those things, so this is what you expect to see. Somebody prances out on the stage and looks like the Michelin woman. <laughs> you, you can anticipate she's likely to fall on her face and not be able to do all of these things. So anticipating that you thought what you see is what you would get, the Lyon Ballet dressed all their guys up, like padded all these guys, you know, it's like, like I'm lumbering out there and everyone is scratching their head because everyone thinks what you see is what you get. And then they started to dance, started to dance. Amazing. So you could see the, 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 the talents of, of dancers, notwithstanding they look like they kind of larded up. And just in case, if you didn't get it, you idiot, you know, 
Then in the end, they stripped it all off, they pulled it all off, and then you could see what you expected to see initially. So I think this has very much to do, again, with the question of understanding the content of work. What's given to you, what you have to look for, dig for, speculate, and so on and so on. Next, next one. This is a project that was done about, I would say, 12, uh, 15 years ago. Um, and, and I have to say, with, with our work, and this is not an aspiration, but I think it's a truism, there are qualities of it, since there are no clients uh, in the room, there, there are qualities of it that are sometimes crude and rough and clumsy and awkward and in the process of becoming. And that's because, I think, to go back to the original argument, if you think most of the world is yet to be discovered, and this is not a slogan for a lecture in San Juan, but you actually believe that, and the people you work with believe it, then the process of discovering content is a process of working it out by drawing and building. So we stuck this, this is in office headquarters in LA, so we stuck this lemon rind up here next. The antecedent for this project goes back uh, maybe 10 years or so. This is a house next. And the solution immediately raised the question, this is made out of blocks, which is a conventional building material in the States and here as well. But the material that the house is made out of is antithetical to the curvilinear surface that the original conception suggests. So you're making a curved surface out of orthogonal pieces next. And the theory of making blocks was typically, you know, a block is orthogonal, and guess what you make out of a lot of little blocks? You make a big block, right, blocks to blocks. So this, this is, is 1,000 eight by eight by eight blocks, all the same, all different, fit together. And I think one more point, which, which I think is, is important to all of us. This is done in the era where transitioning to various kinds of, of, of software. So we, didn't, we weren't able to do this in a formulaic way. We were trying to discover how to do it so it wasn't a matter of, of punching up a software or stretch it, fold it, bend it, elongate it, any of those things. They weren't available to us. And I think what's, what's interesting, and I should say this to all of you, it's not only what you do. It's not only what you do. It's when you do it, the time that it's done. And the reason this is important is that I think and I think I can make the case, if this is done now, it's done with very different tools and is in fact part of a kind of growing repertoire and pro forma for making architecture everywhere by everybody. So it may not be so hard to do. Now whether that's applicable to a general audience or to a public audience, one could debate. But in the context of an architecture discussion, Again, I would say, if you did it before it was formulaic, if you had to work your way through it in order to understand how it might be made, this is a substantial point and it makes it a different kind of effort. Next. Then if you use, for instance, a rhino menu, <clears throat> which, outlines, which outlines various moves and various choices, and makes options available that were not available to us at the time we were doing it. So I would say again, the time, the chronology of the project has everything to do with its meaning. Next. 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 Uh, this is a project uh, called The Box. Um, which is also, uh, for us, an, an interesting subject. By the way, it's a beautiful book done, which I think is still in print, done by Harvard University with, with a very touching essay by Herbert uh, Mushamp. 
on on this project done a few years ago. Um, what's 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 important to me about this subject, and it has to do with both this and with with the discourse in general, is that it represents not a solution to something, but it represents the tension between possible solutions. I think I could make an argument that for the first half of the 19th century, again, a simple argument, that for the first half of the, uh, of the 20th century, not the 19th century, first half of the 20th century, the box was an ideal in a Mondrian sense. It was an ideal, it was an aspiration, uh, uh, something to achieve. And for the last half of the 20th century, the box is anathema, antithetical, step on it, break it, kill it. Any number of architects have made that argument. So what we wanted to do with the project is build the box and not the box simultaneously. And to defoliate it completely ruins the, dis <coughs> ruins the discussion. Uh, and, to, and to keep it entirely as it is also destroys the discussion. So again, the objective is to hold on to a tension between possibilities, meaning you can go left and you can go right simultaneously. Next one. Uh, you saw a cut in the roof. This is a stair going up the stair looking out the top. Next. 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 Uh, this is a project that we did for the Los Angeles Philharmonic Fleischmann in Esapeca Salon and when it looked like the Disney Hall wouldn't get built. Uh, next. And there were some proposals and a long discussion of essentially a, a simple space that could be rearranged variously with an outdoor venue for 20 musicians. Next. And what we're looking at here is a model that uses existing trusses, takes existing trusses and inverts them, makes steel trusses which are new, and essentially goes through a kind of IQ lesson of pieces that, that, that are used to assemble the area for seating and uses those in various ways. Next. So this is, this is the canopy. It's a canopy of bent glass. I think we were the first people to do this, um, to bend glass and to laminate, attach it overhead. And you can see, uh, you can see the uh, seating area. And I remember the discussion. It was an important one to us and because we were told you can't fabricate it, you can't draw it, you can't engineer it, it'll leak, it'll break, and they'll sue you. And of course, every one of those things happened. Uh, and that all happened. Nevertheless, next, next. And by the way, and I should say, this remains an aspect, notwithstanding that they make this, this glass now in Barcelona with Cricursa, they make it in Mexico City, and they make it in Shenzhen. But at the time, we were trying to make our own. It didn't quite work. But in the idea of participating in the process of engineering, designing, and fabricating these pieces, I think is part of the way we work. Anyway, next. And there was, there was a bit of this as the prognosis uh, read out. Next. And finally, it was built. Next. You heat it, put a tea bag, and drop a lemon and some honey in it. <laughs> yeah. um, so this is this is a project we work on, and uh, with with the ubiquitous <laughs> cast of uh, Putin, Kasyanov, Gref, Shmuzafarov, all of these characters uh, that made up uh, something called still called the Russian government. They're still bumping around over there. And on the left is, is the old Miriansky. Miriansky, in our terms, is the Kirov Ballet. And I think for, for young students, and I think this has happened to us on a couple of occasions,
to have an opportunity to work for a company like this stretches really the definition of architecture, the meaning of architecture. You're outside architecture now, and you're dealing with the most remarkable human capacities. I mean, if this were in San Juan, they wouldn't need a building, only because it's cold as hell in St. Petersburg that they need one. But this is a remarkable opportunity. We won a couple competitions uh, for the uh, new Miriansky, which is directed by a guy by the name of Valery Gergiev. Anyway, I try to jump through this quickly. Uh, the, the old is on the left next. And this was the original sketch for the project that the, that the newspapers in that time, this is like 0203, uh, labeled the iceberg or the Californian's iceberg, something like that. Um, it's nasty. So. <laughs> Sometime. Uh, next, that was just the beginning. Uh, and, and we had all of you uh, have an affinity. This is this is this is another one of these architectural dictums about rules and systems and modules. So not wanting to be li left out of that discourse, we did have a system of modules we called pillows that we used in working with Valeri on the project. But the pillows had to do with structural issues, acoustical issues, sight line issues, all of the issues that pertain to the organization of the theater. And as we adjusted those pieces, just like with a little, with a little project with the blocks, cutting the blocks, so we adjusted the pillows. Next. This was, this was an early scheme. I'm not going to tell you what they called it. Next. <laughs> but Valeri liked it. Next. And then here we got into a discussion which, which, which very much belongs to the history of concert halls. Symmetry and asymmetry, the czar's box. And by the way, we also introduced a substantial piece of glass, which we studied very carefully with the Europe guys in London. But anyway, the study model looking from the stage. Next for the first phase. And then, you know, it's funny the way we work. We've added the capacity to, to, to print, to CNC, all of the software. We don't seem to get rid of anything, interestingly. So we're still Xeroxing things. I'm still drawing by hand. So the argument that all of these procedures and tools automatically makes the process faster and faster at least in our experience, is not necessarily true. What it does, if you take advantage of it, is to give you an opportunity for a very new dexterity to look and to understand and to work in very, very many different ways, not necessarily to speed it up anyway. So this is the clay version. Next. And then fitting, fitting the glass, the seating, the lock, and so on uh, into the building next. And then this was, this was the, the scheme that won the first time. And, and I think, and I still think we made a, a big mistake on this. In fact, Nober told me, don't do it. And we showed the, this in the, in the uh, Russian pavilion in the Venice Biennale when it wasn't decided. And when we showed it, it turned into a huge public debate which occasioned the rerunning of the competition, therefore next one. So it was, it was done again, next, done again, and here was the clay again, next. And it, it's funny, I, I told this story last night, and I, I don't want to embarrass anybody too much, including myself, but I was looking for ways to sound more plausible as a 19th century borrowed from the French Russian neoclassicist. So, in presenting this project, you know, when you look at the neoclassical buildings, and we had diagrams, you know, they're divided, they're divided horizontally in three and vertically, but you know it's coming. And it, so I, I explained the building and tried to associate the meaning of the building, the organization of the elevation of the building with, with 19th century Russian neoclassicism. It's not a foreigner, you know, all of that. And it obviously was. And, and uh, a friend, uh, Wolf Pricks, was, was on the jury, and he, he said to me, after the jury, he came up to me, he said, Moss, you know, I closed my eyes, and it sounded really good. <laughs> and, 
and I open my eyes. <laughs> Hasta la vista. Uh, next. Next. I, I don't go through all of them. Next. 